tax incremental financing presentation um, led by our economic development director, Jim Z. Kuborn. Good evening. Um, we also have Todd Taves from Ellers here this evening as well. Um, and he'll be here to assist with any questions that the council may have on a larger and statewide scale as well. So um, the council had requested a TID TIF 101 kind of overview. And so um, we put together a presentation this evening. And of course, we'll be um, here for questions at the end as well. So we wanted to start off with a few key terms. TID versus TIF, right? We hear both of these all the time. They get interchanged quite frequently. Um, and increment, what is increment? These are th words that we hear thrown out all the time. So the TID is the tax incremental district. That is the actual boundary that is created um, as part of the community. That's what's identified. Um, the TIF is the tax incremental financing. That's the actual tool, the TIF development agreement, the incentive component, the increment that you hear us speak of often. The goal is, of course, for created new increased increment, and that, of course, is the new taxes that are created because you're creating a tax incremental district and working through tax increment financing tools to incentivize different projects to come within your community. It is, of course, a powerful economic development tool, um, and we capture that increased increment or property taxes for growing our community. Anyone who's uh, worked in any capacity around TIDs and TIFs see this chart, this slide, and this back slide. How do I get back? Lori, I just messed it up. previous. If you just click on the previous right there on your Wait. screen. Wait. I'm supposed to. <laughs> second, second one from the menu. One, there you go. There we go. Cool. I need readers. <laughs> Um, okay, so these two charts you'll see quite frequently. So if you look at the creation of the tax incremental district, you'll see the creation at the bottom of your screen. It creates the base value of that district, and that base value is what the taxing entities continue to collect on the property taxes during the term or the time frame of the TID that you create. Um, that baseline property, then you jump up and you'll see that as the time frame, there's the captured increased assessed value while different projects come within that time frame of that district. And that increment is what is utilized for investing in that district. So that may be for the TIF incentives as well as the infrastructure during the time frame of that life of that TID. And there are different life frames for TIDs. Once the time frame has expired on your district, you now have a new value, an increased value based upon the growth in the plan that was set on that district and the different um, investments and projects that occurred during the life of that TID. Now all taxing bodies then collect based upon the increased value that you have created because of the tax increment district and the incentives and investments that occurred within that time frame. So why use TIF? So tax increment financing is the ability to promote economic development through new development projects and redevelopment projects. One of the things I like to look at too also is when we have a developer that's coming within our community and they're investing a large sum of money into our community, either by building a brand new facility or redeveloping a facility or, or redeveloping a brownfield site, right? This is a fiscal partnership, not just cash or an incentive or whatever it may be. This is a partnership. We partner with our developers in many different aspects, and this is just one component of being a fiscal partner with our developers and our, our local businesses. It does create new increment, new property taxes, new jobs, and it is our way to stay competitive. We've been working on an incentive um, bidding out against another state, and it's really interesting to see how you compete with other states. So there's a project right now where we're competing, and on a local level, we came in very similar on the incentive involved on this um, prospective project. And there's only two cities in the running in the United States. What we're gonna get beat on probably is the state level. So the state that we're competing against is throwing in some ARPA funds more than likely because their level of investment is quite substantial. But this is our competitive aspect. When we're out there competing, and it may be in different um, portions of the Midwest, but it may also be in completely different portions of the United States. There are several different type of tax increment districts. And so we have mixed use and industrial, which are 20 years. Our blighted environmental and rehab districts are 27. 
The numbers that you see in red to the far left of the screen are how many districts we have in each one of those categories within the city of Janesville. Um, TID 42, which is on the agenda for later this evening, would be an additional blighted TID, and that would make our numbers 16 active TIDs within the city of Janesville. The but for test, you'll hear this often as well when we're talking about creating new tax districts as well as new TIF incentives. The but for is using the TIF um, to show that if it wasn't for this tool, this project would not occur at all. It would not occur at the level that is being proposed or within the time frame that's being proposed. Um, and so this is, again, something that we utilize to be competitive. Um, how, again, also looking at the but for, there's different aspects that we look when we're looking through a TIF application, and some of that is going to be reviewing the developer's source of funding. What is their capital stack? What are their cash flows? What are the return on investments on this project? Making sure that they have enough of their own equity and their own investment in this project as well. Um, also, if it's a challenge site, if it's a brownfield site, there are additional costs to be able to mitigate a brownfield site. There's also additional costs to mitigate properties that may be sitting within a floodway as well. Um, there's extensive public infrastructure costs in some of our properties. If someone chooses a site that may not have all of the public infrastructure that's already there, that increases the development cost as well. Um, and if we have specific areas in our community that are not getting the development and attention that we want, um, a tax increment district would be created to increase the capacity and opportunities for that area to be able to develop. It is part of the marketing aspect of our region. When you look at what is the procedure for creating a tax increment district, um, these time frames can be tightened, they can be shortened, they can occur within a couple of months, and sometimes they may be longer, but there is a process to go through when creating a new district. So the feasibility study is a big aspect and big portion of, there's many moving parts to be able to come up with a project plan. Um, and one of our phenomenal partners, of course, is Ellers to help us walk through making sure that when we create a new plan for a new tax increment district, that we are being well thought out, planning long term, and being extremely comprehensive to make sure that any new plan that we put in place will create the best opportunity and the best case scenario for success for the city of Janesville. Um, we also go through a joint review board, initial review. There's a public hearing and the plan commission review, and then it gets referred over to city council. City council's vote is technically the final um, date that the, and the creation date for a tax increment district, but it does also go back for a final joint review board um, review and a uh, vote as well. And a state approval is the final process. And any, any process that's done creating a new tax increment district before October 1st is then effective that year. Our TID creation team, um, I am remiss because I did not put on the top of this, the TID creation team also includes so many different people on our staff. It is economic development, it's the planning department, the public works department, the engineering department, our GIS staff, our assessor, our clerk treasurer's office, our finance office. There are so many different staff members who are involved with creating the plan, implementing the plan, as well as working through and the management of all the different moving parts of all of the different incentives as well. But on the official aspect, the TID creation team is our attorney. Our attorney also creates a review and a letter needed for the creation by state mandate. We have our joint review board, which has a municipal member, a public member, the school districts, we have two, a technical college and a county member. And then our advisor, of course, is Ellers. Can't say enough about Ellers. Eligible project costs, there's a few. I won't go through all of them. There are many different eligible costs associated within a TID district, and all costs must be associated with that specific TID and the plan that's created around that TID. And then there are costs that are not allowable within a TID as well. So anything for constructing or expanding municipal buildings, um, facilities finance using utility user fees, general government expenditures, and costs associated with newly platted redevelop um, residential development, except for within a mixed-use district, and that can be 35% or less. Our council policy 61B specifically refers to our mixed-use districts for multifamily residential use of TIDs. Amendment types. TIDs can be amended. On the boundary aspect, a TID can be amended up to four times in the life of that TID. As for the plan amendments, 
there is no limit on the amount of amendments that you can make uh, specific to the plan, as long as you are not changing the boundaries. An expenditure period, this is something you may hear us talk about as well. An expenditure period is the maximum time period that TID can be alive, and it generally ends, the expenditure period is five years before the expiration of the district. An extension, such as our Council Policy 100 for affordable housing, does not, expend, it does not extend the life of the TID itself. Beyond that expenditure period within those last five years, TIDs can continue to cover their debt service and existing obligations, contractually obligated expenses, ongoing administrative, um, and of course, if it is a donor, TID can continue to make those donations as well. Um, the TID may stay open until the maximum life is reached, that may be a 20 or 27 year, um, or when tax increments and in re the revenues are collected to pay the project's obligations and the municipality must pass a resolution to close the district, which you'll see one later this year. There will be a TID that will need to be closing. Um, the remaining funds after a TID is closed are distributed to the related taxing jurisdictions, which is a shared benefit because we have now increased the value of that district. But anything that is outstanding, unreimbursed, or any other liabilities is on the city and risk of the city. TID lives can be extended. There is a four-year extension. We currently don't have any of those that would be valid for the city of Janesville, so I won't go through those. The three-year um, TID extension would be for distressed TIDs, and we do have Council Policy 100, which is a state-allowable one-year extension for our affordable housing fund. Again, Council Policy 100. Um, eligible project funding options, there is the upfront TIF. The council has seen those where the city is giving the developer the funds upfront based on the project and the review of the uh, costs and such um, and the increment that would be created. So the city would give an upfront TIF incentive and then that would be repaid back over the term of that TIF agreement by the property taxes created. The other way that we're seeing more so that the council policies have pushed the staff to go towards more so is the pay as you go. So we look again at the project and the finances associated with that and the um, assessed growth, the assessed value growth, and we then create a pay as you go option. So as the property taxes increase, they would get a portion of that back over the term of the TIF and that'd be something like 10 year or 15 year. Um, a TID that generates excess increment may be also able to allocate some of its funds to specific blighted area TIDs, um, rehabilitation and conservation TIDs, distressed, and they must have the same taxing bodies. So since we have two different school districts, there are some TIDs that would not be able to donate to other TIDs because all four taxing bodies do not line up. Um, increment sharing requires that a project plan amendment be done. If a TID wants to donate to another TID, that donor TID requires a plan amendment, um, and that is done through the JRB um, and City Council, but the recipient TID is not required to make a project plan amendment. The life of the sharing relationship lasts until the first one ends, either the donor or the recipient, and any TID can share with more than one TID. It is not restricted to just one. And of course, whenever possible, development agreements should contain provisions to protect the community if the TID increments are not sufficiently generated. Again, this takes a lot of different review. We have our legal review, management review, as well as finance review when we are working through our TIF incentives. Just reiterating, TIF is still the most important tool available to help our local government. Um, it requires a lot of administration amongst many different departments. Um, and of course, leading through the Economic Development Office first. Um, and it does um, plan ahead to position ourselves for development opportunities and keeps us competitive. It has been around for a very long time and we all hope that it continues to stick around. So I stand for questions as well as we do have Todd Taves here from Ellers to help if you have any overall state level um, or long-term questions. Any questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this should be a presentation that you give at that 
new council member orientation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, you did a really nice job of kind of bringing it back in, in normal words. Um, just a couple of quick questions. So we've historically given out TIF incentives at 90% of the increment. Mm, not always. Well, I've seen some at 59%, 75%. They're all over. And, and how um, do we determine that? Oh, gosh, it really depends on the project. Okay. Um, I've been here now a year, and it seems as though more of the higher level is on the multifamily, not necessarily on the industrial side. Um, but yeah, I've seen from 59 to 90%. There's a big difference in there. Again, we have to make sure we look at the full budget and the ROI. We do not want to be putting in so much money that the developer is making uh, a large ROI on the basis of us assisting that project. So, so do we look at what percentage our incentive is to the overall project to how much they're putting in yeah. that, that's all gets factored into that yes yes as well as the increment that they're going to create too right if that project creates so much of an assessed value and we know you know we could start at a higher level but they don't need that higher level then we just back that down okay so so we can like if we want a manufacturer you know we can offer them more and, and another warehouse maybe gets a little bit less we, we can we have that ability to pick and choose how much we give to whatever the development is based on the development based on the their budget project their budget mm -hmm. but also it doesn't have to be a there's no rules so like if we just mm -hmm. said boy that we really want this place because they're bringing in higher paying jobs mm -hmm. there isn't like well you have to look at the budget that's what we do but there's a lot of leeway yeah, the council policy says that the, we have the ability to go up to 90%. Um, I do know that the council has made an exception and has done 100% on something, so it must have been something that the council felt really strong upon. Okay. Um, but there have been some large industrial developments that were at 59% because the, the project just didn't need that much public support. And with the jobs incentive packages that mm -hmm. we do as well, that's based on the average or living wage, and mm -hmm. that is a state statute thing. Like we can't say, "Oh, you're going to pay more," so we're going to adjust. We can't. no, it's not a state statute. We go by the MIT's livable wage index. Okay. And so our policy, our rules internally, are to go by the MIT's livable wage index. It's published online. Um, and we work with two working adults with two children in the home, and that changes every year. So last year it was twenty-one oh eight, and this year it's twenty-four dollars and seventy cents. So for every job that you pay for, and it's job, not including benefits, it's right. pure hourly pay. For every job that's twenty-four dollars and seventy cents or higher, the payout for that job incentive would be four hundred and thirty-three dollars and six cents per job per year, generally over a ten-year term, and they are audited every year. But if we want to incentivize somebody that's willing to pay thirty dollars, again, can we adjust the amounts? That is not how we have operated. Right. I don't know if there's really any state rules. Yeah. Okay. I'm and sure we could change. Right we could do, change our policy and make it more flexible. Yeah. And I don't know yeah. if that's the right thing to do, but there's no state policy that says you have to use the MIT living wage. No, it's our it's our process. We could change our policy, if, and yes. I'm not I'm not making a motion to do this, <laughs> but we could change our policy to yeah. say our jobs incentive needs to pay 125 percent of a living wage. Right, we can change we our can policy. I know that the state's policy is extremely lower, extremely lower. Okay. Um, they're at 150% of like the minimum wage. It's really low. Okay. So. And again, I'm not advocating for that, just to yeah. know that we have that ability. Yeah. Thank you. That's Mr. Jackson. On page 33, a TID generating excess increment may allocate it to any of the following blah, blah, blah. Who is the TID here? Uh, is it the manufacturer? Is it a, a committee within the district it's that can the district. make this allocation? Oh. Um, hold on a second. I don't have page numbers. I have a slide. Ryan, what's page 33 on the slides? Roll back, roll back three if you can. Right Increment now. sharing. One more. That one. Okay. So a TID generating excess increment may allocate to any other TID. Okay, sir, can you repeat your question? Yes. Uh, who is the TID? Is it the manufacturer, the com a committee? Who can make this allocation? So this would be a 
amendment to the plan to be able to donate to another TID. So we'd have to go through that formal process, right? So the Joint Review Board and the City Council would have to make an amendment to the TID plan to utilize excess funds from that district to then donate to another district. It's district to district. It's not by a manufacturer. Hey, I'm seeing that as a possibility in 42 that's upcoming where there might be something allocated outside of the initial TID. So I'm just trying to figure out who would make that decision. That's a TID plan amendment, so that would go to the Joint Review Board and Council. 32 is a prime example. TID 32 was donating to, Ryan, you're going to have to, is it 21, 22 in 36? Okay. Nailed all three. Um, so TIDs can donate to more than one TID, right? And that is only if the excess is there to do so. So TID 32 was set up to donate to three other TIDs. And there was a max capacity that was built out in those planned amendments. Now 32 ended up with more projects in it than the initial plan. So TID 32 is not going to be donating as much to those TIDs because it had its own projects that it needed to fund first. So are you saying the city council then is the determinant? Joint review board and council for the plan amendments, yes. You would review what we're proposing to donate to and why we would be donating to and what type of projects. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you, Jimsy. Yes, absolutely.